It's the Goody Two Shoe Show. It's the Goody Two Shoe Show. This is the Goody Two Shoe Show. Yeah, I got some new shoes out. Yeah, the Goody Two Shoe Show. Goody Two Shoe Show. Goody Two Shoe Show. This is the Goody Two Shoe Show. Yeah, I got some new shoes out. I am super excited. I know that Brian and Aaron are as well. We are your hosts. My name is Carlos. We got Brian around here somewhere, and then Aaron is also here. We want to welcome you to episode one of season two of the Goody Two Shoes Sneaker Show. So uh, to get things started, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to who you just saw in the music video uh, previously. That was our good buddy Jay. He is a friend of the show, a friend of mine, and a very talented musician. Uh, he wrote that song for us, and that is going to be for the time being and maybe for the unforeseeable future, our theme song. So thank you to Jay for writing that for us and uh, shout out to Aaron for putting together the music video. It looked amazing. So thank you for that. Uh, secondly, we wanted to introduce a new, a new thing that we're gonna try. So over the next week, uh, we're going to invite all of our viewers, anybody who's watching right now, all 38 of you. Wow, I'm super excited that you guys are here. Uh, all 38 of you, we want to invite you over the next week to take some on-foot pictures of your sneakers and hashtag heat this week. So in the song that you heard, uh, Jay was talking about, I got some heat this week. So we want to hashtag heat this week and tag us on Instagram at goody 2 shoes LV. Look at the bottom of the screen right now. You can see what I'm talking about. But at goody 2 shoes LV, hashtag heat this week. We're going to do our best to compile every one of those posts that we find and then feature them on next week's episode for a segment called Heat This Week. We're gonna show your shoes, shout you out on Instagram, so on and so forth. So over the next week, if you guys can remember to hashtag this week, tag us, and then you'll see, a, you'll see yourself on the show next week. So that is that. And uh, I think without further ado, we're just gonna get right into it. Welcome back to season two, we're excited, but we're gonna get right over to Brian for all right, guys, it's the moment you've been waiting for. Uh, we didn't want to take too much time with all the intro stuff because we want to have our guests come on. Uh, so for those of you that haven't been paying attention to our social media, our guest that coming on is considered to be a legend in the sneaker community to many. Um, he's a very humble man, and we're excited to have him on. From surfing the streets of L.A. to tagging the streets of Philly to disrupting the hip-hop and sneaker community in New York. Please give a round of applause in the chat to our guest, Ari. Hey. Very generous uh, info, uh, intro. Wow. <laughs> Old clock behind you. Look at that. Yeah, timing is everything. That's amazing. Facts. He, he, he had a line with it, too. That, you're on top of it, man. <laughs> Look, I, I, this this act is polished. So, <laughs> um, all right, you're the man. Uh, the three of us have had ample time to to talk to you over the last few weeks. Uh, we've become a friend to you, and and uh, we really appreciate you spending some time with us on the show. Uh, we can't thank you enough for. I mean, you can see behind him, guys. Everybody, it's eleven fifteen where he's at in New York right now. So, thanks for coming on, and and also thanks for staying up so late with us, uh, just to talk. Appreciate Thank you. you. Really appreciate that, man. Uh, I, I, it's about supporting everybody, you know? I know that sounds cliche, but uh, a, a lot of people don't talk to the smaller shows. They only talk to the bigger shows or the bigger media or any of that. And uh, that's not where I carved my name, so that's not who I'm worried about. Talking to guys like you on this sort of grassroots level um, who are aspirational, I'm in. <laughs> so... Oh, I'm glad to be here. Thank you, really. And, and thank you for the generous uh, intro. Really. Yeah. <laughs> Brian worked hard on that. Uh, he, uh, he, he surprised us all with that one. But <laughs> start by uh, doing something fun. We usually try to do something fun with our guests when they first come on just to kind of break the ice. But we wanted to play a game with you. So uh, what Brian has done is compiled three pictures of, mm -hmm. that we found on the Internet of people who are wearing the shoe that you designed. And we would oh. like you to rate their outfit as honestly and as, uh, I don't know, how, however you want to rate their outfits, 
uh, we, we'd like to hear your opinion on them. So, Ryan, go for it. Okay, let's do this. All right, let's see what we got first. Aaron's going to pull up a picture here in a second. All right, so here's the first one. We, we really want to get your thoughts on this one because, you know, the whole message of the shoe. <laughs> oh, I got to get a little closer up to the... Oh, let me let me make that a little bigger. That's this awesome. was my this was my favorite one, by the way. Okay, uh, so the question is the fit, correct? Yeah, the fit. All right. Well, uh, look, man, nothing could be more straightforward. And you know, I'm I, I'm I'm a, a big proponent of the basics. And some, you know, I'm one of those guys that you see, I'm kind of flamboyant. I go a little over the top and. And that's not for everybody. I get a lot of criticism for that, but um, just a good pair of jeans, beat up, well-worn, not worried about it. Uh, the shirt, of course, which I really don't see. I don't see that shirt around much. Um, even when the sneakers and I see they get resold and they pop up online and people are telling me stuff. So the fact that those are together, that's just, you know, he's just, he's indulging. And I'm not a smoker. The sneaker was not about promoting smoking. But I understand that there is a there is a uh, uh, an element of people, uh, a, a portion of people who really identify just because of the the tobacco parody, the Newport parody. So, I mean, when in Rome, he's doing it right. So he's got the box, the shirt, the shoes, just a perfect pair of jeans. There you go. I mean, he's winning, and I, I don't know where he's at, but he's probably in his backyard and has more yard than I got in New York City. So he's winning. <laughs> thumbs up. Nice. Two thumbs up. Oh, oh. All right. that was a good one. All right, let's see what's next. This one appeared on one of those larger platforms, uh, and uh, they did give credit to the shoe. Hey, uh, <laughs> my guy right there. <laughs> uh, what's to be said? I mean, he's, look at, he, first of all, the feet like this. <laughs> you know, that's that's some that's some that's some gang action right there almost, you know. Like that that pose maybe a little bit of this, a little bit of that. But uh it, you know, you can not Mr. Brown, he um he's one of a kind. And the, the thing that I really like about him, we've had conversations over the years. Uh and at one point uh we were trying to get together so that I could work on some album art and it just didn't happen. Um what he was working on, I was working on, didn't really match up. But he is the he's the type of weird that I completely identify with. He's funny, he's humble, he's a nice guy, and uh, he he uh, he's it, his it isn't about his fit. He's just wearing the shoes with an outfit, but they don't have anything to do with each other. And if you're going, if you're really going to show off some sneakers, have a completely blank slate up top so that all people can look at is your feet. Yep. And uh, you know anything Danny does is a thumb up for me. So you know I look. I'm I'm humbled by the fact that he even wore those, that he took them on that show, that they became a discussion on that show, um, and that uh, you know uh, a cat like him and Trinidad can chop it up, uh, and they both have a certain flamboyance to them. So you know I'm I'm a fan <laughs> of that. Win. It's a win. I know that's pretty generic, but anything Danny does, I, look, it's a go for me. He's Good got word. my full support. No, nah, I really, I really think you're right. Like, if you want to show off a pair of kicks, wear a blank slate. Like, I feel like that's always like the go-to. You got to fly a pair of kicks, yeah. wear a white tee and some jeans, and then let the kicks speak for themselves. Yeah, that's exactly it. Because otherwise, um, you know, you're competing with, with your, the energy you're trying to give off. For me, I, my sneakers are never, never trying to stunt that hard. Right? I'm never really trying to, um, you know, upstage myself. So I, I, I compete with my shoes. I try to make my shoes a lot of times more low key. But if you're trying to stunt, if you're really trying to show up and get the fanfare, you know, wear all black or all white and let your shoes do the work. You can only wear white pants if you're Dominican, though. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Listen, this is New York City. People walk around looking like Jesus all the time. That's true. <laughs> People walk around claiming they're Jesus. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Right? And I, I talk to them. You never know. True. Yeah. All right, we got one more for you, Ari, and then we're going to get to the next part. Uh, this one is, is in New York City, I'm assuming. Uh, There's a New York City legend. Ah, come on, game. man. 
that's the perfect fit. Head to toe, jean shorts, the sneakers, shirt, hat on a motorcycle. And no, I don't like, I don't, can't tell where he's at. It's probably Harlem. I, I mean, I would assume so, but it's on a hill too. So it could be Harlem. It could be the Bronx. I don't know. I don't know where that photo was taken. I've seen it before. And look, you know, rest in peace, my man. He was a, 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 a good dude, a leader of a, of a crew of cats that are all talented and thoroughbreds, as we say in Philly. And um, he, he was a fan and I'm a fan of his. Um, it's, it hurts when somebody that's that unique and that special, especially to hip hop. I mean, you know, sneaker yeah. culture is one thing, but hip hop is everything. For him to have checked out, man, is is heartbreaking. So, uh, salute to that general. And uh, you know, it's ASAP Yams forever. 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 Word. That's a good photo, man. Good choice. Thanks for uh, thanks for humoring us with these uh, with these photos and uh, that was fun. I didn't know what to expect. Yeah. It's great. <laughs> uh, so, mm -hmm. usually I ask questions and, and kind of get to know where you're at on a little bit deeper uh, deeper level. And obviously, with you being who you are and the work that you've done in the past, we want to talk about the shoes that you designed. Well, I think it was 05, right? Uh, well, I designed them really right. two three years before that. The right. release was in 06. Okay. I think it, if I remember correctly, I think it's in May. I always forget. I have it written somewhere. I think it was in May. Gotcha. Of 06. So you and I had the opportunity to speak on the phone uh, a week and a half, two weeks ago almost. And we talked about the shoes and like, how much are we going to talk about them? What can we talk about? What can't we talk about? So on and so forth. And you pretty much gave us free reign. Like, let's just chat. Like, let's just have an honest, raw conversation about them. And one of the things that you talked about maybe the most during our phone call was the details of this shoe. Mm. So if we have a picture, I'd like to display it. And I want to kind of pick your brain about the details of, of the shoe because you said that every detail was intentional. Yeah. There was a reason behind every detail on the shoe. So we'd like to hear some of those, some of, what some of those intentions were, why, why they were designed the way that they were. And maybe some of your favorite features of the shoe and maybe some that you look back on and you're like, what was I thinking? <laughs> Just enter the shoe. Um, yeah, well, let's let's have at it. I mean, I can tell you the details, the, the way my process is, uh, the details are everything to me. Um, and that's something that was happening long before. And when, when, when the designers, when you take somebody like Tinker Hatfield and they go in, they're actually designing the shoe. I did not design a shoe here. I applied a concept with details and colors to it. Right. And a lot of people use that word to freely design. I did not design a shoe. And no one who's putting any colorway of textures and patterns or anything to an existing model is designing a shoe. They are designing sort of the skin of it. They're designing the look, the flavor of it for the moment. But the silhouette, the panels, most of that is the same. And some of the work that I've done in the past, in particular the, the, the piece with uh, uh, Steve Espo Powers, we deconstructed it a bit and changed some of those things, but essentially it was the exact same thing. So um, in coming into this, uh, where I couldn't change the silhouette, where I didn't want to change the silhouette, I didn't want to change the panels and the way that it primarily worked, the details are what mattered, right? So all I'm giving to it is all of that. The packaging is a real design, and that's based on another design that exists, right? So it's in, in taking two things that are very familiar in American culture and global culture, which is you know a sneaker and a pack of cigarettes, it, I had to everything had to be about the design, and that's just my process in general. You know, there's very few things except for early in my career where I didn't think about all the elements that were going in, hit or miss. That's always the case. So, um, yes, details are everything. Gotcha. So let's talk briefly because uh, you mentioned uh, on the phone that even down to the color code. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, those numbers were intentional. Do you mind expounding on that a little bit? Yeah, the um, the color code was it had to start somewhere, right? This would be one of one essentially, and if it was going to continue in any form or fashion, in any way, whether it was going to be other items, other uh, physical items, or whether it was just going to be conceptual stuff, I wanted those colors to have a number. And when I wrote graffiti, um, I started writing just really toying around in the late 70s. Uh, but when I really started to 
pick up a can of paint and just sort of play with it in a pen. It was around 1982, 83. Um, and when you're young, the, the name that you choose for yourself, when you're writing graffiti, you choose yourself a name, unless you have some cool nickname, which I didn't. And I couldn't really write Ari, which I actually did for a little while in the beginning in 82. Um, I had these markers called design markers. And I fancied myself becoming a graphic designer. So uh, I called myself Design 29, which is just arbitrary number because design is such a generic name that there had to be others. So um, in the color code, you'll see it's zero, two, and nine. And I assigned the white, uh, the green, and the gold to those particular numbers. And so that's where that color code comes in. So anything beyond that, if I was to do something and use blue, purple, and maroon, they would then take on other numbers and other particular names with it. But the 029 is, my, is related to me because 29 is my number. It's something that I've carried since about 82, 83. Um, so in that is a detail that's very personal to me. I'm very partial to gum sole. I'm very partial to green. Uh, I could have chosen that fluorescent green and that, or that bright green. It's almost like a Kelly green and that fluorescent orange, which are sort of synonymous with the Newport ads, but that seemed to be cliche. And I had already done that 10 years prior uh, on, uh, with my magazine, which we can get into later. So the color code is very much specific to me and those colors um, and their significance to me. Awesome. Thanks. Um, I actually, you know, I, I I was able to see. There's the. Oh yeah. So you see zero, zero twenty nine there. Yep. yep. Just so you know, for people who think I'm always I own a pair, I don't. See, I borrowed them. <laughs> it's another it's another pair that I borrowed. I was actually when I posted in the social media about um, doing this interview, uh, one of my boys was like, "You is that you know? Do you want to borrow them?" And I was like, "No, no," but. I, th I anticipated that we might talk about the details and that there might not be photographs of it. So um, yeah, the color code again is, it's significant because of that. Uh, my right well, there. Sure. If you want to pull them, pull them out the box. <laughs> yeah. You know, one step at a time. There we go. But uh, yeah. It's, uh, That's right amazing. There. And you see, you know, I don't know if a lot of people have seen that, but it's all hand numbered too. Right. So it's, oh, it's an addition. It's basically, I, I treat it as an art release. And when you're doing a print or something like that, and you're doing multiples, you do a hand sign and you number it by hand. That gives it the authenticity and lets you know that it, it's been in my hands and these are the numbers. That way it's, it's much harder to fake. And anything that anybody tries to fake needs to be authenticated through me the same way art does. Anything that's not authenticated through me is fake. Yeah. <laughs> the, the fakes of the fakes. So, you know. <laughs> So here's here's kind of a follow-up question. So as as a barber, I don't know if you knew that, Ari, if we had that conversation. I'm a barber. That's what I do for work. Oh. And when I look back on pictures that I've taken of my work 10 years ago, I've been cutting hair for 14 years. So I mm -hmm. I look back on pictures of haircuts that I've done way, way, way far back, and I, I cringe. And I'm like, what was I thinking? Look at this nonsense. So this piece of work that you're showing and we're talking about right now is, is 15, 16, 14 years old at this point. Is there anything that you look back on and you're like, man, wish I would have done that different? Yes. Um, it's, I mean, it, it's weird because when I, when I released these, when I designed them, I was already in my 30s. So it wasn't like I was a kid and I could blame it on my youth. It was, um, it, it, it's a process of sort of the, the, the evolution of, of ideating, you know, of, of designing it, um, of designing the details of it, I should say. And there were a lot of things that I was very excited about in that process. And it was, there was, there was sort of the original idea in the eighties, but it, it wasn't this, it wasn't this idea. It was just noticing that the swoosh and the spinnaker logo looked the same. So that is solid. That's the parody. That's the thing that resonates with people. Um, and the box and the colors, they were all pretty solid to me. Um, but looking back on it, I really wish I hadn't done patent leather. Um, for one, that it cracks so easy and it's a, it's a mess. And, you know, I apologize to anybody out there. But, um, you know, none of these things are archival. They're not going to last forever. This is not something that should last forever. Um, and the box will go on. No matter how the shoes fare, I'm sure the box will fare better. So that the, the patent leather was one. 
um, when I did sort of my miniature manifesto, which sort of came in two, two parts, right? Which was um, me being um, critical of how brands often put sort of like their mission statement, their corporate credo on the tag, on the, on the tongue tag. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they just sort of leave it mechanical on the inside manufacturing tag, right? And so I'm sure anybody who's watching this probably knows those elements, but there's, there's the tongue tag, which generally has information on the back, and then there's the manufacturer's tag. In there, um, the tongue tag I was pretty happy with. Uh, the manufacturer's tag, I think when I went into sort of my diatribe or my, min I, my quick diatribe, my fortune cookie diatribe of uh, being critical of, uh, of Newport and Nike, um, that I, I regret not, uh, I first of all regret saying, now it's our turn. That just seemed, you know, looking back on it, doesn't, it doesn't uh, age well for me. And that just seems a little too cliche in the moment. I think I had said it prior. Um, so that's just cringeworthy. But um, for people who didn't know um, or, or maybe don't know all the details, then perhaps it's important. It's just for me. I'm privy to all the details. And so for me, it's a little cringy. Um, and I think, you know, there's, there's other little things that annoy me about it. Um, I, I think on the sole on the bottom, uh, which here, let me, I forgot that I'm sitting right next to them. So there's, um, this patent leather, and it's not like a very typical patent leather, right? Um, it doesn't look shiny. I can't believe this thing. These things always fall off. Uh, most of the time when I see these things, the, the tag, the sticker has fallen off. But it's usually shiny, and this is, has a matte patent leather to it. It's, I know it's kind of hard to see. There you go. Maybe that's a little better. It doesn't have that usual sheen. Now, the, the, the um, what would you call this? This aquamarine color, which is based on the original... Newport boxes of the 60s. They have this color. And so that is a little more um, patent leather. You see the shine. But in here, it didn't really translate. So this I'm, I'm actually happy with. It's just that the material breaks down too easy where the leather doesn't. But it's all, it, all of it is as good as it can possibly be, to be quite honest. It's really good. It's just that the toe, the minute that it bends, and the fact that this has aged, you know, the material just doesn't age well. We're looking at 15, almost 16 years for this material. Yeah. Um, you know, so other than that, oh, and, uh, the, the soul, right. Um, this is obviously a take on the air force one, which has those sort of like two things. And with this, I created, I wanted to create like water drops and, um, that just didn't tie into the, the overall concept the way I wanted. This was more of like a sweating and wetting kind of a concept. I wanted to, 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 maintain that same sort of a look but it 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 was disconnected from the way that i had been really um um that i had made all the other details more cohesive and so this made se makes sense to me still um it doesn't quite draw in the same way so that's for me that's a little bit of a, a negative but that's me being hypercritical there's all the other details which you know i i'm still very proud of you know one thing i i notice about a lot of people who who grew up doing graffiti or who do graffiti mm -hmm. is they are very nitpicky and very you know attention to detail to the max you know and and it, it in in some cases like it, it can be a little annoying and i speak from experience because i mean even when i'm working with like aaron on editing a video i think he gets a little annoyed at me because i'm so like it has to be this way it has to be centered perfectly it, everything has to be artistic in a sense yeah and it does come from a graffiti background and, and you can definitely see that in your shoe everything you can tell has a purpose for why it's there well it's also because at this point by the time i made these i was 15 years into corporate you know design wow. uh and i you know i have a four-year uh, uh, education in um in graphic design so which i wasn't particularly detailed i wasn't a great student um but uh, the things that I'm interested in, I sort of tend to drill down and, and pay attention to that, right? And so at this point, I'm five years into a, a, a company, a marketing company, experiential marketing company that I created where I'm doing all the creative ideation with a, a couple of my um, friends and employees, uh, my business partner, and we're working with clients. There's just a lot, a lot to that process. Now, in my earlier days in graffiti, I wouldn't have noticed even 
half of those details. I would have been too satisfied with sort of the, the skin of it, the flash of it. And I really wouldn't have gotten into all the specifics and not just, not just the details of the shoe and the packaging, but the rationale. I would not have made this shoe if it was just going to be about, you know, the, 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 the spinnaker and the swoosh. That's funny, but a parody is, is skin deep, you know, there's no, there's no depth to it. And, you know, parodies are funny and they, they last. And we were the king of parodies when we had our hip hop, you know, graffiti magazine from 89 to 97, you know, with Espo's lead, Steve Espo Powers lead and Jimmy and Max and Kenny Mees, we were, um, the whole thing was a joke, you know, it was, it was serious. We were serious about communicating, but the parody was there. And so I had already played parodies out. I had already seen people taking the Tide logo, logo and making it say ride or something. And, you know, there was, I had been through that stage. And so the parody, it just wasn't going to cut it. So for me, if, if I didn't have, if it wasn't connected to me personally and the, and the, and, um, the pain within my family of going through smoking and people suffering from smoking and drug addiction and alcohol, if it wasn't this thing that was connected to me there and it wasn't connected to the history of the magazine, which it deeply uh, is connected to, um, and if it wasn't connected to my experience in corporate America, not only with Nike, not only with Newport, to be honest, with their parent company, Lorillard, but with other companies who sort of have this you know, claim to ignorance or that they believe that they can be ignorant to a lot of things that they do. If I didn't have all those details, then, you know, then the surface details wouldn't have mattered much anyways, you know? Yeah. I can really appreciate just even your explanation and looking at them. Uh, I didn't realize I've never, I've never had a pair or seen one in person. So just the intricacy too of the details that you're describing, like the tens on, on the little, just above the toe box or even the sole with the RE 10, on them as well. Just um, I myself am not very artistic, so whenever I I get around people like my cousin Ryan, uh, it's a little intimidating for me <laughs> because I don't have that. Um, I don't have that behind me, but I think that's dope. Just just with you explaining it, and I, I wanted to ask just a follow up question to that. Yeah. So you had that magazine uh, from eighty nine to ninety seven, and it was a hip hop magazine, and so you you've seen the transition. Uh, well. You've seen the different phases of the hip hop culture intertwined with the sneaker community, right? So, yeah. I think what, how would you describe maybe that era in sneakers and hip hop and how they came together? And then, um, maybe even the eras that you, the generations you experienced in your childhood to mm. now in sneakers. Man, that's that's a tough question. I could eat up this whole time together with that answering that. Um, but I, you know, I'm not one of these gents that's bitter. Yep. I'm not bitter. And I don't look back at my generation as the most important. Uh, no more than growing up than people who are trying to tell me that my generation didn't matter and that their generation mattered. So early on, I realized that there were negatives and positives to each decade or each generation, let's say. And when I look back at it, everything was right in its time. Even if there were some things that were better about a previous generation or things that you could see coming that would be better um, or worse, it didn't seem to matter because every generation has so much garbage and so much beauty, right? So I know that's very diplomatic, but for me, that's what keeps my process healthy. And so when I look back at those generations, you know, when I look back at, you know, I remember when the Air Force One dropped. You know, when it was the Air Force basketball team, it wasn't about a signature. It was just about this shoe. And the way that it looked, it was extra tall and it had that like that silver grayish colored strap and the toe, the, the toe box didn't have any ventilation. It didn't have toe uh, holes. I think there were, there was a mesh one, but I think the mesh came after. I think it might've been all leather, the toe box. It was, a, it was, it was crazy looking. <laughs> and looking at that, it was so right in its moment. Because prior to that, we're, you know, we're all kind of fascinated with some of Nike's other things, some of these other shoes, Converse, you know, Chucks, Vans, whatever. But it was a pivotal moment, that shoe. It was like a boot. And what we didn't know then is that they were called, we thought air was a gimmick, you know, like it was just like Nike air because these guys fly through the air. The Air Force One, it was the team. 
It was the, 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 the presidential parody, but there's actually an air bubble in that soul. And we all know that now, and that's what made it so chunky. But imagine every soul prior to that was paper thin, it felt like, you know, you could feel a rock on the ground almost. And so this thing, it looked ridiculous and it looked incredible. It felt like the future. And it would be easy to now to look back on it and be like, that's ridiculous. It's a moon boot. It's become a classic silhouette, right? But this big, chunky, old, crazy shoe is damn near like a, it's almost like a rave sneaker. You know, it's, it's, there's so many reasons to love it and hate it at the same time. Um, well, let me have any because she thinks they look like orthopedic shoes. They do. They do look like nor nurses or to orthopedic shoes. Um, but that's the brilliance of it. This is the, 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 street version of a wingtip. This is like, you know, a wingtip, a man's wingtip shoe, or let's say a penny loafer is forever, right? And this is it. This is the silhouette of all silhouettes. And it's arguable, we could say the dunk, we could say, which is the dunk is, you know, a Jordan, a Jordan is a dunk. It's, you know, there's all kinds of arguments to be had there. It doesn't matter what people say. Looking back at the sneaker game then, there were great things and awful things. Looking back, you know, looking back at the 90s, the thousands, the tens, and now, it's the same argument. Hip hop music, graffiti, there's things that to be missed. There are things that were better and there are things that are way worse. And um, so to be fair, when anybody starts their ranting and raving and complaining about hip hop today or sneakers today, or if a young cat is dismissive of, you know, old school stuff, Anybody like that has got their head up their keister, you know? Yeah. Yo, Ari, we do have a couple of comments from people watching the show that we do want to share with you and then get your thoughts on. So the first one is from our boy, John. And he said, remember Ari driving the ice cream truck for the Espo release at Nike Town? These guys really started the story behind all this. Nike owes him a check. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not, don't worry. I got Nike checks. So they, <laughs> they, they paid me in advance, my friend. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, if if uh, if that's that that night driving around the ice cream truck was something we, I had done for other clients, I had done for a friend of mine, I had done for myself, um, and uh, but with uh, with Espo, it just it it made sense. We're look, we're crazy, you know. <laughs> we're, we're not the guys that are just going to sit around and play the cool guy role. Yeah, you know, wear the right things, wear the hot shit. Excuse my <laughs> language. Um, you know, wear things that, uh, or do things that people are going to, we're not trying to be accepted by, you know, the judging peer group and, um, the ice cream truck, it says a lot of things. It's like, you know, toyish, childish. That's exactly it. I mean, look at the shoe we were promoting. It was clear. It was absolutely ridiculous. There's nothing smart about that. And it took us, we had to push Nike over the ledge, you know, Espo had to keep pushing them to let us do it. They wouldn't let us do the dunk because Pharrell was coming out with us at the time and he was doing an all black dunk with the nerd NERD brain on it. And Halle Berry was doing a rift, which is, you know, kind of feels like the NERD Star Trek kind of a thing. People didn't, I don't know if it was intentional. Um, and then us, so they wouldn't let us do a dunk. They wouldn't let us touch the Air Force One. Um, and so we did the Air Force Two. And so that's crazy and childlike that, 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 um, truck is childlike and all the stuff that I had done for Nike in that same era, which was these, if you look up, uh, put my name in and look up battlegrounds, Nike battlegrounds, you'll see a small low res video of a bus I designed. I took an MTA city bus and gutted it and turned it into a, a basketball promotional vehicle for them back in 2002, 2003, um, all basketball. It's, it's a bananas truck. I mean, it's, it's incredible. Um, and I did John McEnroe. You remember the, the, the beautiful McEnroe stuff that they had released back in the day. They did a reissue, so we did that. Um, and working on the project with, with Espo. So I caught some checks, my man. Um, <laughs> and I was, you know, it, it, was, it was bittersweet to do my project and know that I would probably never work with Nike again. Um, but, uh, you know, they don't owe me anything and I don't owe them anything. I think that's how it is. I'll put we do have one more question, if that's cool, from another uh, person watching from Alejo. He says, Ari, what is the shoe you appreciate the most right now out of all 2020 releases, concept, colors, details? Man, well, you know, I don't care as much. <laughs> um, and it's and that's not to say that I'm not paying attention. I mean, you know, I just, I don't, a certain part of me is very satisfied 
I was very satisfied with um, some of the most basic things uh, in terms of uh, sneaker world, you know, being a sneaker enthusiast myself. Uh, I refrain from saying sneaker head. It never sat right with me. Sneaker enthusiast is what I'll use. Um, what do I like the most? For me, right now, um, I, I, when I get too comfortable, I know that I'm in danger of missing something important. And uh, when there's been too much retro, I start wanting to look to see what's going, what's coming, what's moving forward. And um, I wasn't a big fan of the Vapor Max, but I liked what, what, what was trying to happen there at Big Crazy Soul and all of that. Um, but what I, I did like, and no one else liked, and listen, I know none of you are gonna, none of you are gonna agree. You're gonna be hypercritical, but I really liked the 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 270, and I liked it not because I wouldn't wear it, and it really wasn't about that. I just liked that they were trying to take some of the best of what had happened and figure out a way. It had elements of uh, of what you might see in an NMD, which you know Nike ultimately created themselves. I mean, they they sort of innovate, and everybody sort of takes. Not entirely. They've got their fair share of taking. Um, but then there was that, you know, the air, the, 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 that air technology. It was really obnoxious. And it has this sort of weird, um, almost presto feel to it. It was doing maybe too many things that I don't know. Maybe in the future it'll be a classic. But those are the kind of things. And I'm always a big fan of Nike going back to any of the Air Max OG color situations where it's mesh with simple... Uh, uh, white leather, you're getting into the infrared and that sort of neon green and the grays and the black. Um, what's the, what do they call the blue? And somebody's going to text this right away. Uh, I forget the blue, but it's electric blue and home or something. What's but yeah, so anything that touches with that, that try, it tries to take a little bit of the past and, and combine it with four, whether it's hit or miss, whether it's corny, whether it's whack, I'm not really concerned with. So for me, um, there's no shoe that specifically colorway wise. Um, I always, you know, I can always say uh, Jordan bread, incredible, you know, like, but that we're just, that's just rehashing the past and remixing it a bit. You know, I like when they try to take some chances with a little bit of old school. Anyways, wait, did you have another question? I hope that answers your question, my man. <laughs> Probably no. not going to be the answer you wanted. I, again, I'm not wearing two seventies. Look, I'm wearing barrow, barrow boots from polo <laughs> right now. There you go. Uh, but I do have some sneakers to show. That is great. And uh, yeah, I think one more question that I wanted to ask, because we definitely do want to see some sneakers. And I bet everybody watching right now is curious to see what you like, what you wear. But uh, before we get to that, if you could briefly kind of take us back, your earliest memories of sneakers had to do with skateboarding, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And uh, with the brand that was formerly known as Vandora. Vandoran. Uh, or da Vandoran. Vandoran. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that is now known as Vans. Can you tell us a little bit about your history with that brand and, and what it means to you? Oh, man. Uh, Vans means so much to me. Um, and to Vans, you know, I think I might have seen Adidas before I saw Vans. Okay. And I definitely saw variations. Everybody was sort of bootlegging Adidas running shoes, and everybody was sort of bootlegging um, uh Chucks. So there were always these, these sort of variations of that, right? Um, but Vans, Vans were when I realized the power that a shoe could have, that a sneaker could have. Um, and we're talking 1978, I think, roughly. And back then, Vans, uh, you know, you would go out to the valley and you would uh, you would go to these stores. Van Doren had stores, so. Um, when I was a kid, there were these leftover like shoes brands from like uh, Tom McCann and Kinney. And these were like these, you, your family would go and get Sunday shoes, you know, or work shoes or, you know, church shoes, whatever. Um, and then they started to put in these athletic shoes, right? Well, Van Doren came in in their era and sort of created their own shoes, now, uh, their own shoe stores. Now, I don't know if they sold other brands at one point. I don't think so, but I don't know. I'm not, I'm not the Vans history buff. I just know that at some point I noticed skaters and skaters were wearing all kinds of things back then from Chucks to whatever, but Vans were sort of the surfer shoe. 
and skater skaters early skaters back then the dudes from Dogtown that we would see uh and that's if you don't know Dogtown that's Santa Monica down there like that area around Santa Monica which was hood um was pretty rough those dudes would wear it right so when somebody when I discovered skateboarding and it was from these old slalom type of surfer dudes and then I noticed the Dogtown dudes I was like, oh, now this is something. These dudes had swag. They had, you know, style. They were, you know, these guys were unapologetic. Some of them were fun. Some of them were angry. But these dudes had, they had a, a, an emotion to them. And the, I noticed the shoe. And so when I knew that, I went out to the Van Doren store out into the valley, right? And here's a Van Doren store. And their factory is right down the street. So when you go into the Van Doren store, here were these silhouettes, right? So let's say that if, you know, I... I don't have any vans right here, but let's say it was this, and you went into the classic vans, uh, to the classic van silhouette, you could custom make them. There we go, right there. So look at that. What is that, an authentic or? or, or uh, era. Era, okay, it's got the collar lining there. Okay, um, yeah, so if you take that, hold that up for a second. You see it's pretty much made of three panels. There's that back heel, right? Then there's a side panel, then there's the front uh, panel, which is sort of like the toe box, if you know, for people who know it as that. Um, and each one of those panels, you could go into the Van Doren store, they pull out a piece of like Xerox paper, like, like, you know, photocopied paper and they go, okay, so you want the slip on? I'm like, yeah. They go, how do you want it? So you could buy it right off the shelf. They're like, how do you want it? Wow. I was like, what? You're right there. And so they had these, these rings, like a binder. Now this is pre Nike ID, pre anybody. And they had, because the factory was right down the street. So they had this, all these samples, they had the, the, you know, what became the classic checkerboard, right? Hawaiian prints of different colors, you know, the golden color, the red, the blue, all the classic stuff, and then experimental things and white and red, gorgeous canvas. They're all printed on canvas. It was all canvas. And so you, they would pull out the shoe and they'd write down, okay, the front is, is red, the, the, the middle is black, you know, the back is, is uh, uh, red. And then I, I don't remember if you could customize the stripe on, on the midsole, you know, on that, on that vulcanized, classic vulcanized sole there. Yeah, that stripe. I don't remember if you could customize that. That it might not have been, I, maybe, but I don't think so. That might've been pre-made and everything else was just cut. But, so then you'd pay, you'd give them your phone number, you'd go home, and I don't remember whether it was like two weeks or three weeks, you get a call at your house, mind you, no cell phones, no answering machines, nothing. You just call and they'd give you, they'd call you however many times till somebody picked up and say, hey, your order's ready, come get it. Now here's the thing though, here's, the, here's the, the most brilliant thing and the thing that Nike and anybody else has failed to do as far as I know, is that you could get one shoe, whatever colors you want, and the other shoe didn't have to match. Wow. So. I immediately had, I don't know whether I peeped somebody or whether it was just my own kooky thing, but I had whatever colorway I got, let's say it's the three colors, three panels, I would do the, the other shoe the opposite. So I have pictures of me, they're not good, but I have pictures of me in the 70s with like OP shorts, two-tone, you know, like the, 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 the classic, you know, skate, skater um, t-shirt, you know, of a brand or one of the surf companies and me with tube socks, up to my knees with stripes on them and two mismatch vans. But there, you could see that they're coordinated. That was one of one. I was the only one that made that colorway as far as I knew. And mismatch, you know, mismatch, which, you know, no one was doing. And the, the attention that I got showed me the power of sneakers, the, sh the power of footwear, especially when put together with, you know, the right, right combination. But it was, it was less about the shoes it showed me that I could be unique in a sea of the same. And for me, it became less about trying to score shoes that other people had. It became, how can I be unique in this process and still have it look good? How could it be fly? Um, and that was, like I said, that was like 1978. And from then on, sneakers for me meant something else because I'd spent years making custom vans. Right. And then I graduated into, you know, um, I think I showed up in Philly with Vans in 1982, slip-ons maybe even, and the cats in my neighborhood, you know, I was no. the only, I was the only white kid in the neighborhood, it was a black neighborhood, and they were just like, what they call it, like fake shoes or no-name shoes, bobos, They're like, what are those bobos? What the <laughs> hell are you wearing? So I immediately 
the, the pressure got to me and I couldn't buy vans anywhere. There was no online. There were no stores that sold them. It was a West Coast thing. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that ended that era. And guess what was next? You know, it was Nike. Yeah, I know we talked about it a little bit, but it, it is kind of crazy. Uh, when we spoke before, uh, growing up, Brian and I grew up in New York City. And so like you, when you moved to Philly, we never saw vans. You know, like no one at our school wore vans. You wore a fresh pair. We call them Uptowns, Air yeah. Force Ones or, uh, you know, Jordans. And that was kind of, you know, every once in a while people wore Reebok Classics or, you know, that, those silhouettes. But vans, we never saw them. And so when I moved out to the West Coast, they were new to me. And I remember it, I was so hesitant to put on a pair of vans because I was like, well, I, like, I would have I would never get caught dead wearing these in New York City. But I'm on the West Coast now, so let me wear them. And then funny enough, like. You know, I think with social media expanding the way it did, kids in New York started seeing people all over, you know, celebrities, rappers wear vans. And then they started wearing vans out there. And I remember taking a trip out there and and I'm in maybe Soho and I'm, I'm looking around and maybe Soho's not the, the best example of what New York City is like. But <laughs> I'm, in Soho, I'm in parts of Brooklyn and I'm seeing kids in like skate highs and and old school vans and i go whoa this is a new era of, of sneakers in new york because like you your experience we probably would have never seen them people in them before yeah yeah <laughs> you know when you show up in vans and a skateboard too which was just not not what was up to show up in my hood with <laughs> vans and a skateboard it was being white was hard enough but showing up with vans <laughs> and a skateboard it was you know cowabunga dude and surfs up and you know hang ten and Oh, you know, it was it was brutal. It was brutal. But um, it, it was interesting because as I sort of succumbed, uh, succumbed to that pressure, uh, that peer pressure to a degree, I still maintained some of my Cali roots that way, you know. And um, as I then started to, I, I sort of put the skateboard away for a couple of years because I didn't really know how to manage it. There were no skate shops as far as I knew. Um, again, you couldn't just Google something and it popped up. It was just, I was in the middle of nowhere with nothing, you know, in this crazy city that was, you know, wild and dangerous and the hip hop was really starting to blow up heavy. And, you know, I was, you know, watching my back everywhere I went. So as I sort of did things to uh, adapt and blend in, I looked for ways to make myself unique besides just being, you know, unique by color and culture default. And as I started to skate and got back into skating, and I came down and just to downtown Philly and discovered like this skate scene that was happening. I was showing up hood style, like, you know, with like maroon, maroon shirt with maroon, like Lee jeans or something and, you know, Sergio's or something. And then maroon chucks, you know, head to toe, like completely matchy. And skateboarders back then were like these punk rocker dudes that were wild. And so I'm coming down there looking extra, extra ghetto to them. And they're looking extra corny to me because they're all rocked out and whatever. And I understood their cultural perspective, but they didn't understand mine. It wasn't, it wasn't for a couple of years, really, a few years in, that some dudes in the hood, in different uh, hoods in Philly, started to discover skateboarding. And it wasn't many. And so I was always unique, again, in skateboarding because I was a dude with Adidas forums or Concords, like some real, I was not going to wear skate shoes. Other than Vans were not skate shoes to me because they were just shoes. They were, they were the, the sneaker of, of that culture. Yeah. So um, uh, by the time, you know, it came to the point where I could wear Vans again and dudes were wearing Vans or some other skate shoes, I, I never wore skate shoes again, except for Vans, of course. But I never wore Airwalks or any of that, uh, 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 DC, none of it. Not, not once, not ever once. Word. Word. Well. I kept it hood. <laughs> <laughs> For yourself. Um, so I mean, we could we could honestly talk all night, and it's it's midnight where you are right now. We got a couple minutes left with you. We did want to see what kind of shoes you rocking. What are you into right now? Do you have a couple pairs of shoes that you'd like to show us before we let you go? Um, what I'm rocking is pretty much. Ex I, I have so many pairs of shoes, you know, and I, I'm not some collector type guy like that. I just accumulated a, a massive amount. I probably have three, 400 pairs and they're spread out in different locations. And so I don't have access to them. And I sort of like take 10 pairs and rotate them. Um, but you know, I, I didn't want to talk about that. I wanted to talk about 
things that I like. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> and these are these this is an interesting thing because if you're talking to me you know you're not talking to me about my full career you're talking about me specifically because this is how people know me right they don't know me for all the other projects the other accomplishments um a lot of why this worked and why people accepted this was be was because of the people who knew what i had done prior mm -hmm. the nike work the work with you know the various hip hop groups over you know many years, the magazine covers I designed, the interview process, the the album covers, logos, all those things. And if you know me, then you know I am about the the absolute oddity, the wrong thing, you know about the parody. And this is just you know this is Reebok sort of made the aerobic shoe iconic. And if you know the 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 uh, Reebok freestyle. I think it's a freestyle two, it might be called, or freestyle. It's that high top one that I think in New York they sort of they they associate it with um, salt and pepper and those videos of them and like those classic looks. In Philly, it was like men and women wore them. And if you were kind of like a hustler, a dude from the hood, and you were fly and you had money, you would have blue ones, red ones, green ones, white ones, yellow ones. You would have different things, and you know it's like some basically a lot of stuff in Philly is about just being slick and well put together and done, especially back then. And so I think that is in many ways a continue over of just that flyness. If you have money, you're polished, your nails are done, you know, you could be a straight killer, but you know, you're this guy that, that, that was into that. So these, when I saw these, I just couldn't believe it. You know, it was like, it made sense because they're comfortable and everybody's grandma and dad probably had some bootleg pair of these and some franchise owner, this, I don't, this isn't, a, 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 I don't think that Burger King made these, it's probably a franchise owner that owned multiple locations and made them to have uniforms. Because if you look, which people may have seen pictures of these, if you look underneath, and I don't know if I can do this justice, um, but there's another tag under there. See the letters? Oh yeah. <laughs> and, and the tag, so it's a cover up. You know, it's like they took a generic soul, probably made maybe in America, I doubtful, probably in, in, in um, China, let me see. Yeah, made in, made in Korea. Um, mm -hmm. So they took a generic silhouette that's basically a bootleg of Reebok, and they customized it for their employees, and they made an employee shoe. That's and dope. so when you look at everybody making bootlegs and parodies and all of that, and we think about like the parodies of the '90s with the rave era and all of that, this is '80s. Yeah. And this was nobody was they weren't doing it intentionally. They were doing it because they thought it was cool. So I, obviously <laughs> I'm not wearing this because it's not even wearable. It'll just break apart. But you know what am I wearing? I'm wearing a pair of polo barrel boots. Nope. Uh, but um, let me see. And what am I about to wear? I've had these on stash for many years. Ooh, 97s. And um, you know, 97s are one of my favorite shoes. 95s, 97s. Uh, Air, any of the Air Max pretty much up to 97, I, I pretty much like. Um, but these are from 2000 and whatever. The, does anybody have an idea? Oh, I got to pull this out. But whatever, this is from probably mid-thousands, I would think, like 2005, five, six, something like that. Um, and it's just gorgeous. Yeah. Know? And there's a story behind it, but none of that matters. Look, here's the alternate. Um, but I've had it so long at this point that it's, um, you know, that it, look, it's the glue is already separating. I haven't even worn it. So I've got to, uh, get a little glue out of the closet, a little <laughs> bit of that, um, classic glue that you all know for those of you that resold your stuff and, uh, patch it up. But that's, what's about to come out, you know, does it clean? I love 97s. That might be Air Max. Yeah. That whole Powerwall collection of Air Maxes is incredible uh, it's every uh, i always give uh, an air max the benefit of the doubt you know <laughs> even meaning every new model i'll give it the benefit of the doubt i'll go and check it out and uh, a lot of things i won't wear but i'll put them on a shelf and stare at them you know it's design it's industrial design it's art that's wearable uh and a lot of the things that i accumulate in my life um at one point i collected full-size arcade machines and it was for the design, it wasn't for the gameplay. And I wow. still have, um, which you can't see, but I have a full-size Donkey Kong machine that works in my bedroom, full-size. Uh -huh. right. And it's, 
it's not because I play it. It's because I love the, the, you know, the marquee, the bezel, the control panel overlay, the side art, the cabinet design, all of those things to me are, uh, you know, it's sculpture. Commercial art is the first art I've known. And it's the, and it's the art I'll love the most for life. Wow. Well, like I said, we could talk all night, uh, but it's uh, it's tomorrow for you already over there, uh, so we won't keep you much longer. But we really just want to thank you. I don't I don't think this could have gone any better uh, for us, for our show, for our viewers. I thank you, man. I I can't say I'm surprised. I'm I'm pleased that so many people in the comments know who you are, know your history, and like really just want to know you and like get to know you and ask you some questions. So I appreciate everybody who's tuned in and is watching uh, for being here. It means a lot for the support, but Ari, you are a legend. You, uh, like I said, have become a friend of ours and we hope you feel the same. And, and uh, we just want to thank you for coming on the show and giving us some of your time. Hey man, thank you for having me. And again, like I said, I'm, I, there's no, I'm, I'm not snobby. I don't talk. I don't have any reason to be, you know, I'm not some great, you know, hugely successful guy. I'm, I'm here for you. I'm glad that you're here for me in the same capacity. The people that are watching, I know, you know, some are fans and some aren't, but I hope that regardless of whether you like my work, if you like what I've done, you can appreciate my sincerity and that in the process that I put into my work. Um, and thank, thank everybody for watching. Thanks for having me guys. And, um, I'm going to go get some food. <laughs> that is a wrap everybody. Uh, again, welcome back to season two. Uh, of the Goody Two Shoes show uh, for next week. Uh, if you guys haven't been paying attention to our posts, we have the one and only Danny Stupa on the show for episode two, who is one of the uh, original uh, assigned athletes, skateboarders with Nike, and has had plenty of. Uh, I'm so distracted, I can't even talk while I'm looking. <laughs> I know, I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're good. Uh, good. <laughs> next week, we'll have Danny Stupa on the show. We're super excited. And uh, that is that. Appreciate you guys. Peace out, guys.